Our guest today is Dr. Rita Harvey, who is a partner of Systems Transformation at the Center for Innovation in Education. In practice, this means she works in the stewardship of learning communities of educators to design and implement assessment systems that foster belonging and liberation, and alongside communities to understand how to build assessment and accountability systems that foster inclusion, empathy, co-creation, and reciprocity. It's going to be a great episode. Let's get into it. I'm educational justice coach, Lindsay Lyons, and here on the Time for Teachership podcast, we learn how to inspire educational innovation for racial and gender justice, design curricula grounded in student voice, and build capacity for shared leadership. I'm a former teacher leader turned instructional coach. I'm striving to live a life full of learning, running, baking, traveling, and parenting because we can be rock star educators and be full human beings. If you're a principal, assistant superintendent, curriculum director, instructional coach, or teacher who enjoys nerding out about co-creating curriculum with students, I made this show for you. Here we go. Rita Harvey, welcome to the Time for Teachership podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me, Lindsay. I am so excited. I'm excited to learn more about you. I'm excited to be connected with you and your beautiful work. I and particularly just from before we hit record, just excited about all of your ways of thinking that extend my own thinking and ways of grappling with some of these questions. So really excited. And I think for the first question, it's just, you know, what do we want to keep in mind? What do you want us? What do you want the listeners to keep in mind today as we jump in? Um, this was this was an interesting question for me in thinking about what do we want to keep in mind. And so in thinking about myself, I think there are two really important things that I've been grappling with lately um, as a Black woman, Black mother, um, and thinking about sort of my history. And I think it's the idea that in this particular moment, I think it, it's part of my um, academic intellectual history, but I think black women are a bomb in this world. And so um, I think about even the exact moment when we're doing this recording and the things that have been happening um, and the importance of black women in particular and uh, my history with black women and being um, what it means to heal as a black woman and as a black mother. And then the second thing that I've been thinking a lot about is um, in summer of 2023, I was diagnosed with autism. And so I think about a lot and I approach a lot with an understanding of myself as a neurodivergent person. Um, and I think it comes up sometimes in sort of my, uh, even sort of the linearity of my thinking. And so if I get too divergent, just bring, bring me back. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is such a helpful framing just from like neurodivergence framing and also and like the beauty of that right and like where that takes us in in ways that we need to go to be able to break out of like the way things have always been done because those don't work um, in addition to the the healing and also to contextualize um your point just for listeners to know so this episode will be published a few months from now and so we are recording this on july 23rd and this is just after the weekend where presumably we'll see what life brings us but Kamala Harris will be the presumptive presidential um, uh, person on the Democratic ticket. So very exciting things happening and lots of conversations to happen. So thank you for, for contextualizing us in the time we're in. <laughs> I think one of the big questions that that I love starting with is Dr. Bettina Love talks about this so eloquently with, about freedom dreaming. She names them as dreams grounded in the critique of injustice. So I like to contextualize kind of our big dreams for education, for, for the world, even if you want to go that big. Um, but thinking about that with that quote in mind, what are the big dreams you hold? I think on the sort of most macro, which I think is also very micro, is that we eventually develop and implement systems that are expansive enough to hold um, all of the children that exist. Um, when when I entered teaching, I was very young. I was 22 and fresh out of college, um, having majored in African American studies, and so it was a very sort of <clears throat> teaching became the application of a lot of things that I believed um, in 
in terms of cultural responsiveness, in terms of I was a special education teacher, um, making sure that I met the needs of those children. And, but it was still very sort of philosophically grounded. I was faced with these children. And now I am um, 39 and I have my own daughter who is just turned four. And, and so when I think about education and the systems that I want to create, I want to create systems that can hold my child um, and be expansive enough for all that she is but also all of the other children um, that exist and that enter these systems or especially those that exist on the, on the margins, because I think that would also hold those who are currently centered in many ways um, in the systems. Absolutely. I love this notion of expansiveness too, because I think it speaks to like the problems that we have currently had with our systems is that they are the exact opposite, right? There is this one way to do school. There is this, it is narrow, it is defined. I just love the possibility in the word expansive as well. I, there's there's so much possibility there. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that as the kind of grounding for, for the next few questions. One of the things I think, and even that in and of itself could answer this question as well, but I think there's a lot of mindset shifting that has to happen before we like do transformative work or transform systems um, to be more expansive. And I think that can be such a challenge for folks who are who are trying to live that out. Um, what are some that like what's a mindset shift that you've either seen, coached people through, um, benefited from? What are those like that come to mind when you think about that question? Absolutely. So I think in in the work that I do at the Center for Innovation and Education, um, we as a, as a small organization, we think about um, how to develop systems that have four habits, which in many ways, habits are the beginning of those, practicing those mindset shifts. And the four habits that we focus on are how to build systems that are inclusive, uh, empathetic, filled with co-creation and reciprocity. And all four of those habits are, I think, very, very important. But for me, I think I'm really drawn into the idea of how do we make uh, and build inclusive mindsets and empathetic ones. And so, um, when I say inclusion, it's how do we make sure that people feel safe coming into the system of education? How do we make sure that children feel safe coming to school? How do we make sure that parents feel safe being in their school systems um, and not only feel safe coming into them, but feel a sense of belonging and ownership in those spaces? And then for the second part, it's the idea of empathy as a mindset that needs to develop um, because I think, um, we have to understand the humanity in each other in order to really want to begin to transform systems. And I think empathy and the idea of belonging, they play into so many other things that are important for me, such as the culturally responsive mindset or a culturally relevant uh, mindset. And if we get into anti-racism, you have to, to, to be able to empathize and understand um, where people are coming from. And I think I start with the idea of inclusion leading to empathy because you have to believe that your own needs are going to be met by a system before you can begin to empathize with others in many ways. And so I think for me, um, building mindsets around inclusion and empathy are really, really important as we think about building systems that can hold as many children as possible, as many of their dreams as possible. Wow, that's really great. I, I'm just thinking about your words around just the idea of you have to believe that your own needs will be met and, and before you can start to empathize with others. I think there's there's so much that I want to like sit with with that. It's, that's really good. And I think probably a huge mindset, a huge pivotal uh, piece to some of the transformative work that, that you do and you help others do. So I, I'm curious now with those kind of four habits in mind or, or focusing on those, the inclusivity and the, the empathetic um, habits, thinking about the brave actions required, what is it that either you've done, coached folks to do, seen folks do, that really leads that kind of transformative work or has led to transformative work? Um, so I think I'll focus, uh, focus specifically on sort of the assessment for learning community. And I think um, well, brave actions, that's such a, a challenging concept for me because I feel like some, frequently I don't think of myself as particularly brave. Um, I think not necessarily the opposite of that, um, but as a deeply introverted uh, person who would rather like stay in my little cocoon, I think 
uh, even facilitating learning communities that are grounded in the idea of inclusion and empathy and making sure um, we do an annual convening and we really, as a design team, when we, we have a design team that's for the assessment for learning community that's comprised of largely women of color, um, queer women, and we come together and it's how do we build um, a space or build um, a foundation so that people can come and be feel experience that sense of belonging, that sense of community, um, a sense of empathy. And we frequently do the work in spaces that are not necessarily uh, kind to concepts of like anti-racism and the things that I believe. And so stepping into those spaces and creating spaces that are filled with love. I don't think that's brave. I think it's necessary. Um, creating spaces where people can speak the truth um, about institutional racism and, uh, you know, patriarchy, all of those things, colonialism and the, the impact that they have on all of us. So how do you create a space like that where you can hold uh, many people? And so I think we do that in many ways. I do that a lot of ways by understanding myself, but decentering myself. Um, so how do I create an, an inviting space that allows people to, to do that? And so, um, I mean, maybe it would be braver if I like shared a little bit more about myself. <laughs> maybe that's the next step. Um, because I do like to decenter myself in a lot of the work that I do um, to create space for the voices that I think are really vital. Hi, this is Leah popping in to share this episode's freebie, which is Assessment for Learning Principles of Practice for Equity-Seeking Learning Communities. You can find it at the blog post for this episode, www.lindsaybethlines.com slash 180. Now back to the show. Yes. Oh, wow. There's so much, there's so much. I love the introspection and the authentic like thought process as you're speaking to think about what you're saying as well. This is just, I'm just so appreciate you. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm curious to know too, before we hit record, you were saying, you know, that sometimes those, those brave moments are really at those, that, that personal level. Um, it's, it's kind of those micro moments as opposed to like the big things. And I think your answer speaks to that. I'm wondering if, if there is, kind of a moment in mind or um, a scenario in mind or, or just kind of like a general approach to kind of key moments um, that you've seen really uh, unlock a transformation in someone or, or, or build that space um, and deepen that sense and experience of belonging for folks. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll start by, I think the, um, the idea that the brave action, I think a lot of times we're in this moment where people do say that they're inviting folks in um, and so part of it is actually doing that. So uh, let's see, our latest convening, I guess this is not a space that is not unfriendly to, um, I'll actually talk about our convening in Tucson in Arizona. And Arizona has a really complex history with uh, culturally responsive, culturally relevant practices. And, but they have a really, in the city of Tucson, they have a really robust, uh, culturally responsive program. So when we were planning our assessment for learning convening in Tucson, um, we wanted to make sure that they felt safe. And so we built these bridges. And so it, it, it really required, I think, even stepping outside of my comfort zone in the sense that we went to Tucson, we would meet weekly with um, members of the Tucson community and began to understand what their story was, truly listened um, to the things that they were saying. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking about the idea of invitation, not just inviting in, but the, the slow process um, that's required to even endure just like the awkward moments when people don't necessarily, um, the awkward and uncomfortable moments when you want to fill a space with noise or you want to fill a space. And I think this can happen with students as well, as well in the classroom. Um, the need to be the expert, but really um, step back. So my colleague Soraya Ramos and I um, were planning this convening in Tucson with um, two members of the culturally responsive department. And we were, I remember the first meeting we, we were online and they just couldn't believe that we really wanted to ground in who and what they believed Tucson to be. Um, and we worked with them for six months and it was just 
you know, one meeting after the other with, with both allowing ourselves to be human, but also learning their story, learning about the traumas that they faced as a community um, after their state superintendent had caused, like basically gotten a ton of them fired and the ways that they endured to make sure that they could have this culturally responsive um, Department of Education and the same commissioner that had done, state superintendent that had done that. Um, he was then, the year that we were doing the convening, he was reelected as their state superintendent. And so they were, um, we had to create a space where they felt safe and we honored um, the work that they were doing. So I think that was one where, it, I don't know, I don't know if it was brave on our part, but it was brave on their part to be able to do this. And so it meant that we took steps that we um, wouldn't necessarily have wanted. We wanted to be able to record some things, but we didn't want to put any of them at risk. Um, we wanted to, to share their story in a way that felt safe for them. Um, so, and like, that's what I'm saying. I don't know if that's brave, but it was, it required immense listening and um, just stepping back. And to this day, uh, Rashonda and Lorenzo are people that I respect so much because they are brave all of the time. Um, but they have to do it in a way that also ensures that the teachers that they, that work for them are safe. Um, and so it's both, it's stepping forward, but also knowing when to create boundaries um, to protect, protect folks. Yes, I, I was thinking that as you were saying that it sounds a little bit of a uh, prioritization of, you know, like, yeah, I want to go do this thing. We need to do this thing. And I have this other thing that's really important in the protection of people. And, and I think about that a lot. I think you and I have academic backgrounds in addition to like practitioner backgrounds. I think about that a lot in terms of, you know, research and, and um, like, you know, you need to record things or you need to do this. And it's like, what, what's the balance between the human piece and the piece of like, check the box, we need the thing for some yeah. file or whatever, right? So I, I think that that speaks deeply to, to me. And I think um, there's like two sides to, I think what I'm, I think there's that, there's the actual connecting, but I think like right now I'm working on a, a small research project in Kentucky and we're trying to figure out how to get to the margins of the community. And it is not a racially diverse community. Um, so what the margins look like is like different than sort of how I've conceptualized the margins at other times. But we find that even as we're working with the district, even they don't know how to get to the margins. And so I think that's the brave thing. How do you get to those, um, how do you work and think and become creative in getting to those who don't feel safe? Um, and and that's, once again, I don't think that's brave, but I think I think it's a thing from from the classroom when you have those students whose parents you know you need to talk to, but you're afraid to like call their parents. Um, the same thing, it, it, it sort of happens time and time again. And so the brave action is saying, you know what? Put, like, let me put aside my assumptions about a community, about a person and um, really begin to invite them in um, and listen to what they need so that they feel safe coming in and not just like, okay, they don't want to be here. Right. Oh, yes, Def that, that for sure. <laughs> I, I am also wondering how with, with some of these, this is a bit more of a technical question, I guess, but thinking about creating these spaces in communities where, where or you're inviting in folks at the margins what are the, what kind of stakeholder groups are those? Are those educators? Are those families? Are those community members who are not maybe formally linked to the education system at the time? Are they young people? Are you talking specifically about the one in Kentucky? About any of them really, but so yeah. I think it can be, it can be all of those folks. I think uh, in the work that we've done, it can be those educators who do their job and then want to go home, which is a, like a a position that's it can be those who aren't necessarily tapped for all of the like insider like let's build up this system um it can be the teachers of those students that you uh you know it can be your your the teacher of your special education students it can be those who are doing um technical um the sort of the technical and career education um it can it's also a lot of the time i think um 
when folks tap students, like in the work that we're doing in Kentucky right now, we've noticed that a lot of the students are those who are already centered and they are actually pushing us. They're saying, we know that there are some folks who are excluded. Um, how do we make sure that the, not just the, the research work, but like how are they included in this broader initiative around assessment that's happening there? Um, and also the families. And, and I think that's been, I think that's some of the hardest um, and in, in getting, because there, there are sometimes time constraints, there are sometimes um, language barriers, there are people who have had their own trauma with schools and don't necessarily um, want to re-enter those spaces. So how do we simultaneously, while we're trying to rebuild a system, make it minimally viable for folks to come in so that we can actually build something that's transformative and understanding that it's not, it can't happen all at once. So you can't be dishonest and say like, we have already transformed when you're in the process of transforming. Um, so what are those first steps? And that's something, there's no singular answer for what that first step is because the things that make people feel unsafe, you have to, you have to be willing to step out um, and find out who those folks are. And I think like even when you talk about sort of an academic background and doing the research, um, I can remember even in grad school going to communities that my mother probably would have been very upset that I was visiting um, because it would have, she would have viewed it as unsafe, but those were the folks who needed to be at the center of the work. Um, so I, th I think it can, it, it can look like a range of folks, um, but I think, for me, my brain often lives in those spaces that can be conceived of as untouchable and that other, they get those labels of unsafe um, in some ways. Right, because I mean, if those folks aren't at the center of making decisions, right, isn't it Hannah Presley who said the people closest to the pain are close, should be closest to the power or some um, version yeah. of that, right? Yeah, um, I, I, I think that this probably is really, um, it's very important for folks who are listening to hear it, who may live in the technical spaces of, okay, so give me like a five point, like, what do I do? And I think it's really important when we often kind of rush to action and like do the thing and we haven't built the foundation, as you said, you don't get to a place of transformative change. It's why we keep doing the same old things right again and again. And so I hope folks are taking away that this, this building it takes a while and like it is absolutely essential to do to do the thing you're trying to do right in in a just way yeah and, and I think I, sometimes I, like it almost is it's almost like a snowballing like we I think about um you know many schools have a family resource person who's supposed to be a connection to that community and um in this research we've been trying to think about like how do we get to that but even they only have their, their layer. So then it's like, okay, if you can put me in touch with those folks, can they put me in touch with someone else? And can they like put me in touch with someone else? And that does, that takes time. It takes uh, courage uh, to do all of those things to go into those spaces. Absolutely. And and I wonder, it, I'm sure there are an enormous, like a number, an enormous list, there we go, of challenges that folks could name in this work because it is so big and so important. And so complex in, in some ways, are there challenges that, you know, folks have repeatedly surfaced for you or you've repeatedly seen in action and, and how might a person listening who's like, I'm anticipating this challenge perhaps work through that? That's so interesting when I saw that. So I saw these questions ahead, obviously, um, and I was thinking about it in a, in a very different way and I can still address that, but I think, um, Right now, in this moment, which I'm not even thinking in terms of, well, it is micro in the grand scheme of things, but educators are being asked to do so many things. And I think before COVID, there was already burnout. And then like, you know, a new initiative comes along and you're like, okay, let me just like play along with this until, um, until it fades out, right? Uh, but I think the biggest challenge right now is educator burnout because there has been such a lack of respect for educators. And I think COVID just exacerbated all of that. Um, so I think building, if you're talking about systems level leaders, building spaces, 
that can hold the educators who are tasked is I think a massive challenge because if you're asking someone who's already sort of like doing so many things and facing so many barriers and challenges um, to ask them to do one more thing is just like so much. And so I think that is the thing that comes up the most. That was not what I was thinking of, um, but I mean, maybe it's connected. And I'm curious to know how you did interpret it or, or what direction you wanted to take it. Well, I guess it was going to be very, it was going to be very hard. And it was just the idea. Of, and, and so this is why I say maybe it's connected, but returning to hope and like building spaces of hope and connection. Um, it's really easy to get tired and want to give up when um, you're facing these challenges in your classroom, but they bleed into your personal life and it bleeds into the socio-political sort of atmosphere. It's like, there's no space for a break. So it's the idea of the challenge is how do we create healing spaces so that folks can continue to do this work um, when it's really tiring and draining. That is excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Okay. That's, I think that's really connected to what you initially said, connected to all of the events, which, right. We, we sometimes, um, pretend in school systems like we're gonna ignore the outside of the school building and it's like what no that impacts how we live lives like every day it can't be ignored <laughs> it cannot be ignored and it I mean we can put it in packages like culturally responsive teaching but I think even there are spaces um in in Aurora uh Colorado we did a convening with um, at a school that was for parenting teens and others in the community who needed the space. And it was a very small school, but you could see the commitment because the principal was trying to hold the space for the teachers to hold the students to hold their children. And so it's just like, you can't, you cannot escape from any of the components. It all comes into the school. Um, so even if, if I say that I just want to teach English or I just want to teach math, it's not possible. Um, and I don't, I'm not saying that from like a moral or it's just like, even if I like, even if it is a moral imperative to me, that's not what it, it's just, you can't, you cannot get t children to do what you want them to do without taking care of their basic needs um, in these ways. But to put that burden on the teacher, you can't just put it on the teacher. So the whole system has to hold the educators, the child, their family. Um, and so I just think about interconnection and interdependence in, in that way. That was so well said that I'm going to leave it at that. I, that's going to resonate with me for a while. Thank you. Um, I think just to close us out, if someone is, and I think you spoke to this a little bit earlier, so you feel free to double down on that response. But I think um, when we do this, sometimes it feels like such a big thing, cultivating the space where people feel a sense of, you know, um, belonging, a sense of perceived safety, you know, all of that is, is big what's like the first kind of get the ball rolling momentum builder that you would suggest folks do if they're listening to this and going ahead and like entering the day with hope on their brains and in their hearts? Um, if you're a teacher, I mean, there's that student that you're convinced, like as you go into your school year, that is not interested in being, you get to know them. Um, if you're a systems leader in that way, you get to know the family of that that student um, start very, very small um, and understand and not in a condescending way. Um, like I genuinely want to know who you are. Um, it can be the student who is not interested, but it can also be that student who just like drives you crazy. We know you have that student who annoys you. We know that there is like someone who you're like, you talk too much. Why are they doing that? What is the need behind that? Um, begin, if you have the capacity, to employ a little bit of empathy um, to understand what's happening in whatever part of the system you're in. Awesome suggestions. And then just to close with that, I love this question for absolute fun does not have to relate to what you're doing in your work, but it can. Yeah. Uh, what is something that you've personally been learning about lately? Um. <laughs> This is really, it's, it's very silly. I, um, it's not silly. It's not silly. I'm my family. We moved from Massachusetts to Texas in 2022 and we bought our first house 
in 2023 and I have a garden for the first time and I really want to be successful at gardening and I have killed a number of plants I am a succulent I've killed succulents like doesn't matter I killed so I'm both gardening and learning about gardening from books um from the people in the community from my dad um so I've been learning and thinking about gardening and ecosystems which very much so could relate to education but um, I'm doing it in the sense that I just I'm learning about what it means for me to get my hands in the soil and get dirty. So that's that's one thing that I've been thinking about and uh, learning about. That is beautiful. It one I resonate. I kill every plant ever given to me. So I just <laughs> wish that that wouldn't be my experience. I want to live vicariously through you. Uh, and it reminds me a lot of Adrian Marie Brown's writings with like fractals and like just all of the naturey things. So super cool. I'm so excited. Um, lastly, people are going to be really excited about your work and interested in connecting with you. So if you're comfortable with it, where can folks learn more about you, connect with you or your organization, if that feels like a better place to direct folks? Sure. I'm going to say it may be your, if I think my email address is on there, um, I can say my email address. It's Rita at leadingwithlearning.org. And I believe our website is, uh, leadingwithlearning.org. I believe it's not Center for Innovation and Education. <laughs> Uh, and if you look, if you search for Center for Innovation and Education, you will find me there. But it will also say that our organization is closed. It is not closed. It's just that we're no longer housed in the space where it was before. Amazing. Rita, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and brilliance. It was really a pleasure. Thank you. If you like this episode, I bet you'll be just as jazzed as I am about my coaching program for increasing student led discussions in your school. Shane Safir and Jamila Dugan talk about a pedagogy of student voice in their book, Street Data. They say students should be talking for 75% of class time. Do students in your school talk for 75% of each class period? I would love for you to walk into any classroom in your community and see this in action. If you're smiling to yourself as you listen right now, grab 20 minutes on my calendar to brainstorm how I can help you make this big dream a reality. I'll help you build a comprehensive plan from full day trainings and discussion protocols like Circle and Socratic Seminar to follow up classroom visits where I can plan, witness, and debrief discussion-based lessons with your teachers. Sign up for a nerdy, no strings attached brainstorm call at lindsaybethlyons.com slash contact. Until next time, leaders, think big, act brave, and be your best self. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at teachbetter.com slash podcasts, and we'll see you at the next episode.